good afternoon good evening to all our friends in various parts of the world speakers and chess we are back again with yet another session of acns webinars the first speaker for today is professor miki fujimura from japan professor fujimura is the professor and chairman department of neurosurgery hokkaido university school of medicine sapporo japan he was the past director of neurosurgery at division of advanced cerebrovascular surgery tohoku university graduate school of medicine konan hospital sendai japan he is an active member of the japanese neurosurgical society and he is the council member for the japanese society of surgery for cerebral stroke he is also on the guidelines committee of the japan stroke society and is the secretary of the japanese society of cerebral blood flow and metabolism his surgical interests include microsurgery for cerebrovascular disease moya moya disease aneurysm surgery molecular biology of cerebral ischemia and cerebral blood flow and metabolism he is a noted author who is also on the editorial board of cerebrovascular diseases we are extremely fortunate and thankful to him for accepting our invitation to be a speaker for today's webinar he is going to speak about current indications and technical pitfalls of revascularization surgery for adult myoma disease the second speaker for today is our honored guest from japan professor shigeo oba professor oba is associate professor department of neurosurgery fujita health university toyoki japan he has special interest in the research of glioma He has completed his postdoctoral research in the University of California, San Francisco. He has been an integral part of the Japanese Neurosurgical Society and has also been awarded with many honors for his outstanding contribution towards neurosurgery in Japan. He is an noted author who has published several articles in various peer-reviewed journals. We are extremely honored to have him today to speak to us in our webinar. Today he speaks about molecular biology of gliomas. The chair for the first topic of today is our honored guest from Italy, Professor Giacomo Pavesi. Professor Pavesi is a professor of neurosurgery, University of Modena and Reggio Emilia. Professor Pavesi has particular interest in vascular and skull based surgery. He has operated upon more than 1000 aneurysms and 100 AVMs during his successful career. He is an invited speaker to various international workshops and conferences and he is also a noted author who has published several articles in various peer reviewed journals. We are extremely fortunate and thankful to him for accepting our invitation to chair this webinar. The chair for the second topic is no stranger to us. He is a stalwart and one of the most senior professors in neurosurgery, and is a very active participant in online neurosurgical education. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to introduce you to Professor Vladimir Benes from Czech Republic. Professor Benes is a professor and chair for medical school, Charles University Postgraduate School of Medicine, Central Military University Hospital Neurosurgery Department. He was the past secretary and the current president of the Czech Neurosurgical Society, and is also the chairman of the WFNS Neuroanatomy Committee. He has been decorated with many medals and awards from the Czech government for his contribution to neurosurgery. We are so thankful to him for accepting our invitation to chair this session of ACNS webinars. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President of the Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome both the speakers and chairs. for today to this online platform of asianus webinars dr liu bun singh from malaysia is my co-host for today and with that introduction i would like to hand over this virtual podium to professor pavesi thank you very much uh, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, for the invitation um really honored uh, to chair uh, this uh, session about a pathology that uh, uh, indeed uh, in europe uh, it's a very rare pathology Uh, while in uh, east asia uh, it is uh, very big numbers as uh, we know from uh, professor fujimara uh, experience so uh, i am very uh, interested in uh, what is going uh, to say about the current treatment of uh, moya moya disease that we we know just that it's a chronic uh, Uh, occlusive cerebrovascular disease with uh, hemorrhagic or ischemic uh, uh, presentations and uh, this is a very interesting topic because uh, it is uh, um, addressing points uh, to different kind of surgeries and different kind of uh, monitoring and surveillance of these patients that they can be pediatric and also adult patients so Uh, I leave uh, the speaker uh, to Professor Miki Fujimura, and uh, we have uh, uh, an attentive li uh, listening of his uh, lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Fabesi. Thank you for your kind introduction. 
uh, it's my great honor to talk about Moya Moya disease today. And I would also like to thank Professor Yoko Kato and the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity. So uh, I'm going to share my slide here. Okay, can you recognize my slides? Yes. Okay, so uh, today my talk is about the current indication and technical pitfall of bypass surgery for especially the adult Moya Moya disease. So Moya Moya disease has a 50, 60 years history since its uh, discovery around the 1950 or 1960s. Or, Okay, so the first English literature is 1969, described by the Professor Jiro Suzuki. He is a first professor of the Tohoku University Neurosurgical Department in Sendai. So it's my particular honor to talk about Moya Moya disease because I have been working in Sendai department for more than 20 years. So I have just moved from Tohoku University Sendai to the uh, Hokkaido University Sapporo here on the January this year. So this slide indicates the uh, uh, Suzuki's angiographic staging. Of course, it is very important, but it's very critical to understand this angiographic staging does not uh, indicate, uh, correlate with the severity of Moya Moya disease, but it represents the temporal profile of how the uh, Moya Moya disease patient compensate their ischemic conditions in their lives. So, of course, the uh, stage one shows uh, just a narrowing of the terminal internal carotid artery. But the next, next, in the next stage, there is the uh, development of the intracranial moya moya vessels at the base of the brain. The stage one to stage three is uh, so called the uh, intracranial compensatory stage. Okay. So, but in the late stage, like a stage four, five, six, you know, we can expect a lot of development of the transdural anastomosis coming from the external carotid artery system. This is a, exactly the beneficial, very beneficial pyro synangiosis. So um, due to this uh, beneficial synangiosis, the moya moya vessel would minimize and uh, finally disappear. And finally, all the blood flow is supplied by the external carotid system. So this is the so-called, uh, we call it a physiological reorganization system. And if some, some patient, some people ask me, what is Moya Moya disease? I would answer that Moya Moya disease is a self-compensatory self disease, like a, which have a ICEC conversion, internal carotid, external carotid conversion, or intracranial, external cranial conversion is a pathophysiology of Moya Moya disease. So, uh, but uh, nowadays uh, we know there are so many, lots of patients of the intracranial major artery stenosis, especially in the East Asian countries, including Japan. And we have uh, so many patients with the intracranial major artery stenosis. Of course, the atherosclerosis is the most uh, popular one. But the, uh, um, we also have uh, quite a lot of number of the Moya Moya disease patients based on the uh, MRI vessel wall imaging technique. So nowadays we know the very special characteristic finding of the Moya Moya disease, which is uh, uh, characterized by the outer diameter narrowing of the intracranial arteries and the vessel wall thinning not the thickening like uh, atherosclerosis, but the uh, vessel wall thinning and the uh, development of Moya Moya vessel, of course. Now, these kind of characteristics are com completely opposite to the atherosclerosis. But uh, we now a day, we know a certain number of the patient has this kind of a special vascular pathology. So um, nowadays, Moya Moya disease is not a very rare cerebral vascular disease in East Asian countries. So based on this finding, we have, I mean, the Japanese Moya Moya group have the updated, updated the, uh, revised the diagnostic criteria. So uh, of course, this terminal ICS stenosis is very important finding and the abnormal vascular network formation is critical um, uh, point. But uh, now we diagnosed the uh, Moya Moya disease patient also include the uh, bilateral, not only the bilateral patient, but the unilateral involvement patient or patient with atherosclerosis. We can we ask, accept these 
these patients as a definitive Moyama disease, which means that we ex expand, extend the uh, uh, diagnostic criteria of Moyama disease, which lead to the significant increase in the number of Moyama disease patients in Japan. So it's no longer a very rare cerebral vascular disease in the East Asian country anyway. So, uh, so it's my great honor to talk about the surgical indication, microsurgical procedure of the, uh, because this is a very standard procedure in the Japan. And also, you know, I would focus my talk about the perioperative management for the complication avoidance. So the first important point is uh, uh, bypass, um, bypass surgery is especially recommended for ischemic onset Moyama disease patient. This is the most important uh, uh, surgical indication of, of the Moyama disease patient. But more importantly, the STMCA bypass, I mean the direct bypass is recommended for adult cases. Uh, on the contrary to that, uh, we can perform the direct or indirect or combined vascular revascularization for pediatric patients. So pedi pediatric patient has more chance to uh, accept uh, many kinds of the bypass surgery, but uh, the direct bypass is necessary for the adult cases. And this observation is supported by the most uh, recent uh, uh, March Center meta-analysis uh, report in the general neurosurgery from the Korean group. Uh, it clearly indicates that direct bypass showed a much better uh, future stroke prevention compared to the indirect bypass. And also the uh, direct bypass was associated with a much better angiographic outcome, which means a much wider vascular territory compared to the indirect bypass in the symptomatic uh, Moema disease in the adult patient. So very typical, this is a very typical case of the 36 year old woman with the ischemic symptom on the right hemisphere. And she had the apparent hemodynamic compromise uh, on the right hemisphere. So I think she has a definitive uh, indication on the right hemisphere. And uh, he, here is the angiographic finding which clearly shows the stage three Moya Moya disease. So she has a definitive surgical indication on the right hemisphere due to her ischemic symptom. I would show you the typical movie uh, later on, but uh, this is a very typical intraoperative finding. Uh, I made a craniotomy and opened the doula uh, around the cerebral fissure end, and the recipient artery is usually around 0 0.8 or one millimeter in diameter, and we can make a, a and to side anastomosis to the, uh, the MCA, uh, peripheral medial cerebral artery. So uh, due to, after the surgery, um, she had the benefit. Her hemodynamic compromise significantly improved one or two days after surgery, and we can recognize a bypass in a very high thick signal uh, of the SDA. So in the literature, we have so many uh, types of the bypass variation, the bypass surgery for Moyamaya disease. And uh, there is al always a question whether the STMCA alone is enough or the combination of the direct indirect is better. This is a uh, controversy. This has been a controversy. I personally use the uh, combination of the direct and indirect bypass which means a, a combined revascularization surgery is my favorite procedure. So if we check the recent literature, uh, which compare the efficacy um, of the bypass surgery between the combined surgery or direct bypass alone, the question is combined is better or direct is enough? The answer is, on this slide. Uh, recent evidence show that the combination of the direct and indirect procedure provide, provide much wider vascular territory and, uh, and provide, lead to the uh, much better, much favorable uh, long-term outcomes. And the uh, CBF improvement is better in the combined uh, revascularization procedure. And uh, if, if we combine the direct and indirect bypass procedures, they, each procedure has a synergistic effect. So this is the reason why I prefer the combined direct indirect revascularization surgery for the adult and um, pediatric patient. 
So if we go back to the uh, Suzuki's angiographic staging, which represents a, a physiological reorganization process, the temporal profile of myomatic disease, I think that the combination of the direct bypass for the re reconstruction and the, also the indirect synangiosis, which is a consolidation of this system, um, sounds a much better, much better procedure because uh, to complement the uh, the to support this physiological reorganization system. So I, I think that the unique point of the management of moya disease is the bypass surgery has a very perfect concept to support the, this physiological reorganization system. So I would show another very typical cases of the ischemic concept moya disease patient. Uh, she suffered from the minor completed stroke uh, in this area on the right hemisphere. And the angiography clearly showed the stage three Moya Moya disease on the right hemisphere. Uh, I operate on the uh, symptomatic hemisphere one month after the uh, development of the cerebral infarction. So I would show the very typical movie. Here is the scheme of the craniotomy. Surgery is uh, about a three-hour three hour surgery uh, of the direct and indirect combination surgery. This is a pre-procedural IC green video angiography. Clearly showed uh, this is a very, uh, uh, this hemisphere has a hemodynamic compromise. And uh, fortunately, I found a uh, uh, good favorable recipient artery and with a uh, one millimeter in diameter. So after the temporary clipping, I make a arteriotomy. And this patient, I was lucky in this patient because the vascular wall structure is not very uh, fragile. So anyway, the, um, this is the one, one of the very important points, uh, making the stay suture. The first two stitches uh, is a very critical step of Moya Moya disease because the uh, vascular wall structure is very fragile with the uh, very uh, compromised uh, internal elastic lamina or the media, media layer thinness is a very typical finding of Moya Moya disease. So uh, we manipulate a very fragile recipient artery anyway, but uh, this patient, I, I was very, a little bit lucky because uh, she, she has a, a little, uh, good vascular structure. Anyway, the, after the 20 minutes temporary occlusion time, I could I accomplish the uh, uh, anastomosis procedure. I personally make a single STMC anastomosis combined with a EDMS. So this is my typical procedure. I see Glean clearly showed the favorable bypass blood flow. And after this procedure, I, I combine the encephalodulo myosynangiosis as the combination surgery of the direct indirect procedures. So this is a, a kind of a very, a very typical procedure. I make a dural inversion flap, um, dural inversion and uh, uh, dual patching with the uh, uh, temporal muscle. I split the temporal muscle to the bilayer, so two layers and I made a cosmetic craniopracty like this. Very small skin incision. So this is a very typical uh, procedure of myself. And now after surgery, the bypass is clearly visualized. And um, this is a um, single photon emission CT one day after surgery, which clearly shows a significant improvement of the cerebral blood flow on the right hemisphere. So anyway, I adapt this uh, combination technique, not only for the adult, but also the pediatric patient. So I employ this procedure for the 570 hemisphere for Moewe disease during the past 15 years. So the next question, next question is, uh, there has been a controversy for a very long time, whether the bypass procedure can reduce the risk of rebreeding in patients with a hemorrhagic myomyomatic disease. 
So to answer this question in Japan, we conducted the Japan Adult Moya Moya trial, which is a randomized control trial to examine whether the bypass surgery can reduce the risk of rebreeding. So uh, fortunately, we got a very positive result of the uh, JAM trial, which indicate if the hemorrhage is located at the posterior circulation territory, the rebreeding risk of the patient is as high as 17.1% per year. Very high rebreeding risk in the, the patient with posterior hemorrhage. And the bypass surgery can significantly reduce its risk. So, so the most recent Japanese guidelines indicate bypass surgery is recommended for the Moya Moya disease with posterior hemorrhage. This is the exact result of the uh, most important supplemental analysis of JAM trial. So if the, again, if the hemorrhage is located in the posterior area, patient has a very high rebreeding re risk, but surgery can significantly reduce the risk of rebreeding. This is very straightforward, very straightforward results. So based on this result, uh, the bypass surgery in Japan is significantly increasing recently. Um, I would show the very typical case of the hemorrhagic concept Moya Moya disease. Uh, she suffered from the sudden onset of headache, like uh, this kind of uh, intracranial hemorrhage. And the MR angiography clearly showed the um, finding of the Moya Moya disease. So one month later, two months later, uh, the T2 star weighted imaging clearly shows the posterior location of the hematoma, hemorrhage. Uh, we diagnosed her as having the posterior hemorrhagic myomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyom
Anyway, this patient has a be good benefit from the bypass surgery, and there is no surgical complication. She just have a transient uh, hyperperfusion phenomenon, but uh, she uh, remained asymptomatic during the follow-up period. Okay, so um, importantly, I, I introdu introduced the result of JAM trial, and I, I said that post patient with posterior hemorrhage has a very high risk of rebreathing. But uh, many, many international colleagues of mine ask me this question. Uh, the first question is why the patient with posterior hemorrhage have a high rebreathing risk? why the posterior hemorrhage is bad? This is the first question. The second question is, okay, STMCA bypass is for the anterior circulation, but the hemorrhage is the posterior part. So how the uh, STMCA bypass for anterior circulation can prevent recurrence of the posterior hemorrhage? Uh, all the JAM trial core member didn't know, didn't have the answer of these questions. So we conducted the supplemental analysis, further supplemental analysis of the JAM trial. So uh, I would first show you the answer. The answer is the keyword is a choroidal anastomosis. The choroidal anastomosis is the uh, answer of all of these questions. Uh, nowadays, we know the choroidal anastomosis is a dangerous collateral. Which, which, is, which cause the uh, posterior hemorrhage. And with, uh, choroidal anastomosis is enhanced in the hemorrhagic onset by this patient. So what is choroidal anastomosis? I would introduce uh, uh, choroidal anastomosis. Okay, if we see the catheter angiographic finding of Moyamoya disease, if we check the uh, AP view of the uh, Moyamoya vessels, okay, they are all the basal Moyamoya. They are just the basal moya moya of all of them, the basal moya moya. But if we carefully look at the lateral view of this, these vessels, uh, we can categorize these vessels into three groups. The first one is the anterior basal moya moya, lenticular straight anastomosis, and the thalamic anastomosis, and the most posterior choroidal anastomosis. Choroidal anastomosis, okay? So the supplemental analysis uh, of the JAM trial they categorized uh, the Moya Moya vessel into three groups, and we found that this colloidal anastomosis is the most critical, the dangerous anastomosis. In fact, the, one of the supplemental analysis uh, clearly showed that the posterior hemor hemorrhage was significantly associated with the development of colloidal anastomosis. Okay, and posterior hemorrhage is closely associated with the colloidal anastomosis. And this is another supplemental analysis of JAM trial. Uh, if we compare the angioarchitecture between the ischemic onset patient and hemorrhagic onset patient, uh, we found that the hemorrhagic onset, onset patient has much uh, more development of the choroidal anastomosis. So choroidal anastomosis is so-called a very characteristic uh, moya moya vessel in the hemorrhagic onset patient. So this is choroidal anastomosis. And if we, if we make a bypass, maybe uh, choroidal anastomosis no longer have to make a uh, tremendous effort to uh, provide the blood, uh, blood flow to the hemisphere through this uh, very fragile vessel. So um, the third supplemental analysis of JAM trial provides very important information. Uh, uh, this is a, a non-surgical cohort study of the JAM trial. And uh, we found that the choroidal, if the choroidal anastomosis is positive in one hemisphere, the annual bleeding risk is as high as 13% per year. So the choroidal anastomosis Moses is a very bad indicator for the future uh, bleeding on the hemorrhagic hemisphere and the non-hemorrhagic hemisphere. And if we only focus on the uh, non-hemorrhagic hemisphere, this, this study provides very striking result. Uh, this is a story on the non-hemorrhagic hemisphere, okay? The if choroidal anastomosis is positive, in uh, one non-hemorrhagic hemisphere, annual de novo bleeding risk is 
as high as 5.88%. Okay, this hemisphere is non-hemorrhagic, but the annual de novo breeding risk was very high in, the, in this hemisphere if the choroidal anastomosis is positive. So this was a very suggestive uh, finding. The final supplemental analysis of JAM trial um, also showed that if one hemisphere had a hemodynamic compromise, this hemisphere has a much higher uh, annual bleeding risk compared to the uh, hemisphere with, uh, without hemorrhagic failure. So, so nowadays we know posterior hemorrhage is bad and also, the, if one hemisphere has a, a choroidal anastomosis, or if one hemisphere has a, a hemodynamic compromise, uh, this hemisphere would have a higher risk of bleeding or rebreeding. So, JAM trial provided uh, several very important uh, suggestions for the future man management strategy for the Moya Maya disease not only for the hemorrhagic onset patient, but also for the uh, uh, asymptomatic or ischemic onset patient with the uh, choroidal uh, anastomosis or something. So in the first part, I, I was talking about the uh, surgical indication and uh, microsurgical procedure. So uh, as I, as I, show, I have shown, the uh, number of the Moemaya disease patients is increasing in Japan, and the surgical indication is uh, getting wider. So we have um, uh, more and more patients who undergo the bypass surgery for Moemaya disease in Japan. So, but uh, if we extend the indication to the hemorrhagic onset patient, I also suggest the hemorrhagic onset patient has much more fragile vascular wall structure. So complication avoidance is very important. So the next uh, last part is about the perioperative management, how to avoid the uh, uh, complication in the management of myomyelitis. So this is a very uh, basic knowledge about the uh, surgical complication of the bypass surgery for myomyelitis. Of course, the most important issue is how to avoid the ischemic complication. Of course, anesthesia is very important and we should avoid the thromboembolic complication from the anastomosis side. And also we should avoid the mechanical compression by the indirect uh, bypass pedicle uh, flap. Uh, but uh, another important point is how to avoid the focal cerebral hyperperfusion syndrome. Uh, 15 years ago, uh, in hyperperfusion after low flow bypass was considered to be very rare, but nowadays all of us know the hyperperfusion is a very typical phenomenon after bypass surgery in Moema disease patient. So, focal hyperperfusion can lead to the transient neurologic deficit, but in a rare occasion, it, it could result in the delayed intracranial hemorrhage or seizure. So we should avoid this critical complication. But the issue is the management of uh, number one and number two is contradictory to each other. So the post-operative management has a lot of a pitfall in my disease management. So this is uh, uh, um, the report of myself and uh, uh, okay, if we perform the same procedure, I mean the STA M4 bypass for Moemaya disease patient or atherosclerotic patient, um, after this same procedure, the incidence of hyperperfusion syndrome is much higher in patients with Moemaya disease. And uh, in a rare occasion, uh, some kind of the intracranial hemorrhage can occur in a rare occasion. Nowadays, we have a much lower number, but uh, in this era, uh, hyperperfusion was considered to be very, very, very rare. So many, in many institutions, we manage the patient with a normal tensing with slightly high blood pressure uh, after surgery, so that's the reason why we had a much higher incidence of hyperperfusion in these days. But anyway, the um, hyperperfusion syndrome after low flow bypass is a very typical uh, phenomenon in patients with Moya Moya disease. I would show the representative case. Uh, this is a ischemic onset patient 
with a 43-year-old woman, and she has a um, significant focal hyperperfusion, remarkable focal hyperperfusion one day after surgery. So we attempted the blood pressure lowering, lowering, and she remained asymptomatic in the first initial seven days after surgery, but on the seven, day seven, she has a intracranial, intracerebral hemorrhage due to hyperperfusion. This is very rare. I mean, the incidence of this kind of a complication is nowadays 1%, uh, 1%, less than 1%. But uh, no. the question is, the uh, uh, purpose of this bypass surgery is to increase the blood flow, of course. This is the purpose of the bypass surgery. So, but uh, the question is, how much increase is favorable and how much increase of CBF is pathological? No one had the answer of this question. So we made uh, analysis. Uh, we made uh, analysis of, uh, of um, our uh, consecutive cases of the adult onset Moyamaya disease. And uh, we attempted the uh, ROC analysis to clarify the exact threshold of the cerebral hyperperfusion syndrome and the exact threshold for the hemorrhagic uh, conversion. So the question is, um, in the how much increase of uh, CBF can lead to the symptomatic hyperperfusion? The answer was, we found the answer. And the, we make a small of, uh, region of interest. And uh, if the CBF increases over um, 180%, patient could be symptomatic. I mean, the, the focal neurological deficit or uh, some symptom could occur uh, in this kind of patient. And if the CBF, local CBF increase is over 240%, the patient has a risk for the hemorrhagic conversion. So this is our uh, recent answer, uh, how much increase is pathological. So uh, let's go back to the last case, the initial case. She has a focal increase of cerebral blood flow. But if we, if we attempt the uh, quantitative analysis in this small ROI, we found the CBF increase of her was as high as 240%. Then she subsequently suffered, uh, developed uh, intracerebral hemorrhage. So I, I would say the quantitative analysis of the local, local cerebral blood flow at the site of the anastomosis provides very important information for the period, about the perioperative pathology of Moya Moya disease. So, but if the uh, hyperperfusion is the only one complication, only one risk. The uh, management is quite straightforward. We can just reduce the blood pressure. But in Moya Moya disease, we have uh, some difficulty. Uh, we have a remote, a patient could have a remote ischemia or something. But in, look at this patient. This patient has a favorable cerebral blood flow on the contralateral hemisphere. So the question is, should um, whether we could reduce the um, blood pressure of this patient, should we uh, reduce the blood pressure of this patient sufficiently? This is a question. But uh, the answer is uh, perioperative pathology of Moya Moya disease is much more complex. And the next keyword is a watershed shift ischemia. Watershed phenomenon uh, is a critical issue uh, to, uh, which lead to the difficulty of the post-operative management of Moyamaya disease. So what is a watershed shift phenomenon? So look at this patient. This is a children, but uh, she had a, underwent bypass, okay? She underwent bypass. This is a preoperative and postoperative cerebral blood flow. This is a site of the anastomosis. There is an increase in the CBF, but look at the, this cortex, this cortex next to the, uh, next to the uh, hyperperfusion site. There is a paradoxical decrease in cerebral blood flow. And in fact, the patient suffered a cerebral infarction uh, in the postoperative period. So local hyperperfusion could associate with a paradoxical cerebral blood flow decrease, in the, even in the same hemisphere. Um, the question is, is this 
is this phenomena phenomenon true in the, also in the adult case? So this is a scheme of the watershed shift ischemia. The, if we attempt bypass here, we this area could have a local hyperperfusion. Uh, there could be the transient conflict of the um, uh, anterograde blood flow and the bypass flow. So uh, this area could have a uh, paradoxical several blood flow decrease. This is a scheme initially proposed by the uh, Professor Hiros in the United States long time ago without any several blood flow study. So, so we check, uh, we examine similar um, investigation. We, we attempted a similar inv investigation in adult cases. So uh, look at this case. In this case, uh, the patient has a local hyperperfusion uh, one day after surgery in this area. But uh, if we carefully look at the uh, adjacent context, the frontal area, there is a paradoxical CBF decrease. Okay, local hyperperfusion could associate it with a paradoxical decrease of cerebral blood flow in this area. This is the, uh, uh, this slide shows a watershed phenomena can occur also in the adult cases. Paradoxical CBF decrease near the site of the local hyperperfusion. So we check the, we carefully check the incidence of this phenomenon. So, but the incidence of watershed shift phenomenon, which is the local hyperperfusion and the paradoxical CBF decrease, the incidence is not very low. More than 10% patient had this kind of phenomenon. So uh, this result, these results indicate that the excessive blood pressure lowering is very dangerous, even though we see a local hyperperfusion. Fusion. We should avoid the uh, hyperperfusion, but we should also avoid the uh, you know, cerebral infarction at the remote area. And this makes the postoperative management of myeloma disease very difficult. So this is our recent protocol scheme. Uh, of course, the uh, blood pressure lowering. Blood pressure lowering is very effective to avoid the several hyperperfusion. But excessive blood pressure lowering can incidentally cause the uh, ischemic complication. So uh, we expect uh, this kind of pharmaceutical, pharmacological uh, agent. For example, minocycline. Minocycline is an anti-inflammatory antibiotics, which has a neuroprotective effect for the ischemic insult. And simultaneously, minocycline has the um, effect of the MMP9 um, blockade, which means the uh, blood, blood brain barrier maintenance uh, can attempted by the minocycline administration. And the uh, edalabon is a free radical scavenger available in Japan, antioxidant agent in Japan, and uh, which is which has the effect of the neural protection against ischemic injury but also edalabone can prevent the cerebral hyperperfusion, but uh, a lot of the, this kind of uh, blockade of this cascade. So uh, now, nowadays we, we use antiplatelet agent and uh, uh, mild blood pressure lowering with the uh, administration of minocycline and edalabone. This is our current perioperative management strategy in the adult myeloma disease. So uh, I would conclude that the uh, Moyamaya disease has very unique and dynamic nature to convert the vascular supply from internal carotid or intracranial system to external carotid, extracranial system. Intracranial, extracranial conversion is the first physiology of Moyamaya disease. And the bypass surgery has a perfect concept to complement this pathology. And uh, hemorrhagic Moyamaya disease represent higher Suzuki's angiographic staging and may have more prominent vascular wall pathology, fragility. And the combined bypass surgery is recommended for the, not only for the ischemic onset Moemai disease patient, but also the Moemai disease with a posterior hemorrhage. And finally, the surgical complication, including local hyperperfusion and cerebral ischemia should be avoided by intensive perioperative care. So uh, I, I thank all of my colleagues in Sendai 
uh, where I worked more than 20 years, but now I also I moved to the Hokkaido University, so I started my new life as a, a neurosurgeon. So I thank all, all of my colleagues for my more my disease research and clinical practice. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Pawesi. Thank you, thank you very much, Professor Fujimura, for uh, this uh, presentation of your extensive uh, uh, experience on Moya Moya uh, disease. And uh, listening to your words, uh, uh, some some questions that were rising, listening to you, you have already uh, answered. And for instance, the first one that came in my mind was the uh, choroidal uh, artery uh, theory uh, okay. that leads the, to the choroidal part of uh, the hemorrhagic uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I, I wonder why uh, lenticular striate or thalamic perforators are considered uh, uh, less fragile, maybe because there is a less, su uh, more supply to those arteries uh, rather than uh, choroidal artery. Oh, great. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. This is a great question. So, so I would answer from two sides. Okay. Uh, first point is uh, uh, if we look at the choroidal anastomosis, Choroidal artery penetrates the uh, uh, parenchyma, of course, but uh, it runs, uh, it, it courses through the ventricle wall. There is no surrounding structure of the, around the choroidal anastomosis in some part. And that could explain, that could explain why the choroidal anastomosis is more fragile. If we look at the lenticular straight anastomosis, there is a surrounding structure. Brain, parenchyma is around there around them. So this is one reason. The another reason is um, in the temporal profile, if we look at the temporal profile of OMI disease, the, if the stage advanced, the, there, is a, there could be the development of the etomoidal anastomosis and the transdural anastomosis from the middle meningeal uh, artery from the anterior part of the brain. So the LSA, uh, LSA anastomosis do not have to make a tremendous effort for a long time. But uh, if we look at the choroidal anastomosis, the uh, area around the you know, okay, uh, parietal area is the uh, last part of where the, is uh, benefited by the uh, transdural collateral. So uh, choroidal anastomosis should make uh, uh, effort for a very long period, long period. So uh, I, I think it, it explains you know, why the choroidal collateral has more chance to make a bleeding. So these are two reasons, anatomical reason and the temporal profile reason. Okay, I have a couple of questions. Uh, one is on the diagnostic side. I mean, uh, I, I listen to you, I think uh, the diagnosis of Moya Moya in your country is very straightforward, very rapid and uh, very, let's say, easy to make. Mm -hmm. uh, but do you make, uh, for instance, uh, investigation about uh, CDF uh, demand uh, by uh, provoke uh, test with Dymox or so okay. to, to explain some cases that maybe are not so much symptomatic? Oh, okay. Uh, this is very important point. Uh, Dymox, acetazolamide, um, we use it. We, we use it to check the cerebral vascular reactivity. But on the other hand, the diamox is a little bit dangerous for some patient with a very severe hem hemodynamic compromise or in the small children. And the uh, diamox is, should be avoided in such kind of a very high risk patient. So in such patient, I would just make a, a single photon emission CT at rest, at rest or the uh, arterial spin ASL by MRI or alternative alternative modalities. Okay, and uh, if you uh, have a very mild uh, symptomatic patients, uh, you, you know there is a history be, uh, in front of them so you can decide, but are there uh, a 
some uh, kind of uh, monitoring or uh, clinical or, uh, or uh, radiological surveillance that you make in patients without uh, going to the first time to, to surgery? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. This is a very important question about the uh, uh, surgical indication. So I think the symptom, symptom is most important, ischemic symptom or the hemorrhage. Or the, if, if I recognize the ischemic symptom, I always check the uh, cerebral blood flow, cerebral blood flow. And uh, if the CBF study can explain the symptom, uh, we I, we move forward to the uh, surgery, but uh, if we cannot uh, explain uh, prove the uh, hemodynamic compromise by the uh, uh, examination, uh, I never operate the patient. I just very carefully follow up the patient in such patient. And uh, another point is if the patient is asymptomatic, and uh, if the patient has a hemodynamic compromise but without symptom, uh, this is very little bit difficult, difficult question. It's a case by case, maybe I, I would explain the patient of her symptom because uh, uh, even though the patient doesn't have a ischemic symptom, the patient may suffer from the uh, uh, cognitive impairment in the future or something like that. But we don't have enough evidence for that. So we just, uh, this is a gray zone indication, so. Okay. And uh, last, uh, a last comment uh, about the surgical uh, procedure. Uh, I think uh, making a bypass for Moya Moya is much more difficult rather than uh, an augmentative uh, cerebrovascular normal uh, procedure, let's say for a bypass for any reason, because right. the vessels are very, very much more small and thin. So uh, there is a mismatch you showed uh, between uh, STA and uh, M4 branches. So this, I think this is very difficult to make, uh, to have an experience to go uh, through the bypass for Moye Moye, much more than other uh, conditions. So I, I guess if uh, uh, some surgeons do not have your uh, experience uh, on that. Uh, do you think it's a rational uh, way to treat also adult patients by uh, indirect uh, uh, synangiomyangiosis, uh, uh, avoiding the, the, the problem of, uh, of a direct bypass? Oh, okay, that's a great question. Uh, historically, uh, the uh, previous literature showed that uh, adult patients couldn't uh, have enough uh, uh, benefit from the indirect, indirect only. But recently, some group uh, tried that, and uh, in some, um, uh, we I make a combination surgery, but uh, many adult patients also developed a pyre synangiosis. So, uh, but uh, uh, we have to, we have no way to predict how this patient developed the pyre synangiosis in the future or not. So, we 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 should know the. Uh, indicator, indicator for the how uh, this patient, the single patient, has a chance to develop the prior synangiosis in the future. And so, uh, so the this kind of evidence is not enough for adult patients. So, I I don't uh, recommend strongly recommend the uh, uh, indirect bypass for adult patients. But we should know the indicator. So the conclusion is that we have to centralize to, to uh, very high uh, flow uh, of uh, experience uh, surgery uh, for these bypasses because they are very, very more difficult. I thank you very much for, for your comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I know there will be plenty of questions with our audiences, but as we are running short of time, we would like to go to our next lecture and we are honored to have with us both the speakers and chairs for the second talk, Professor Vladimir Benes. Thank you for joining. Welcome here, Professor. And also Professor Shige Obai yes, is here. So I would like to hand over this podium to Professor Benes. After this lecture, we will have uh, questions for both the speakers and we can continue our discussion. Professor Benes.
Thank you very much and uh, hello everyone. Uh, Professor Oba, I don't think that I need to introduce you once again since the ICNS already did, did it at the beginning. Uh, prof just in short, Professor Ogba has spent five years in the US, so he's uh, very well um, educated in research, since what he did there was the research in gliomas. And he's from Fujita Health, which is uh, one of the best known institutions in Japan. So let me please ask Professor Ogba to talk on molecular biology of glioblastomas. Professor Ogba, please. Thank you very much uh, for your kind introduction. Thanks to Yoko Katoraji and the committee. It is a great honor to be able to speak today. I have no financial conflict of interest disclosure. Glioma is the most common primary brain tumors. Today, I would like to talk about molecular biology of glioma, especially diffuse glioma. Here is the outline of my presentation. At first, I will overview WHO classification, then talk about the molecular biology associated with lower-grade glioma, glioblastoma, and pediatric glioma. Finally, I will talk about treatment for them especially clinical trial based on, based on WHO 2016 classification. Many studies over the past two decades reveal the gene, gen, gen, genetic basis of tumor genesis. So in the WHO classification of tumor of the central nervous system published in 2016, Molecular information was added to the historical diagnosis and integrated di diagnosis was used. The consortium to inform molecular and practical approach to CNS tumor taxonomy, not official the WHO. We call C Impact Now was formed in late 2016 to provide practical recommendation in order to improve the diagnosis and classification of CNS tumors in advance of the publication of a new WHO classification of CNS tumor. C-IMPACT now have been published as April 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, uh, and 7. The fifth edition of clarification will be published soon based on these suggestions of C-Impact now. However, not all the recommendation is accepted in next classification. In WHO 2016 CNS classification, diffuse astrocytoma, diffuse astrocytic and oligodendrogral tumor which was named before as astrocytoma, oligodendroglioma, oligoastrocytoma, and glioblastoma were divided using the status of IDH1, 2, and 1P90Q coordination. WHO grade 2, 3 diffuse glioma, which usually called as lower grade glioma, was divided by the status of IDH1, 2 at first. IDH mutant lower grade glioma is divided by the status of 1P19Q coordination. IDH mutant lower grade glioma with 1P19Q coordination is named oligodendroglioma IDH mutant and 1P19Q coordinated. ID IDH mutant uh, lower grade glioma without 1P90 coordination is named as astrocytoma IDH mutant. IDH wild type lower grade glioma is called as astrocytoma IDH wild type. Historically defined glioblastoma is divided by the status of IDH12 and called as 
glioblastoma are its mutant and glioblastoma are its wildlife. NOS not elsewhere specified is used if the molecular examination was not performed or is inconclusive result. In C impact now update one, not elsewhere classified in neck was recommended to use when molecular examination was performed and provided adequate result, but the result do not lead, the, lead, lead to a precise, precise categorization of tumor within the framework of WHO 2016 classification. You can see that the status of IDH is very important in the classification of diffuse glioma. So I will talk about IDH for a while. IDH is a group of enzymes that categorize the oxidative decarboxylation of isostrate to alpha ketoglutarate. The human body contains three types of IDH, IDH1, IDH2, and IDH3. IDH1 is located in the cytosol, whereas IDH2 and IDH3 are in the mitochondria. Mutant IDH1 to combat alpha ketoglutarate to, to hydroxyglutarate, which is reported to be associated with tumor genesis. IDH mutation is in glioma was first reported in 2008. The mutation occurred in 70 to 90 percent of grade 2 and grade 3 glioma and 85 percent of secondary glioblastoma and only 5 percent of primary glioblastoma. Nearly all IDH mutations involve a single amino acid substitution. The mutation occurs at codon 132 in IDH1 and codon 140 or 172 in IDH2. Also, mutation of R140, uh, was not found in glioma. The commonest is the R132H mutation, which accounts for about 90% of all IDH mutation. IDH1 and IDH2 mutation usually occur exclusively. Since the IDH1 R132H alteration occupies about 90% of IDH mutation, immunohistochemical evaluation with the IDH1 R132H antibody can cover about 90% of IDH1 2 mutation cases. In addition, direct DNA sequence analysis is performed. IDH mutation has been detected as a common mutation between primary and recurrent tumors, and it has also been detected as a common mutation among samples from multiple regions in the same patient. Therefore, IDH mutation is considered to occur at the early stage of tumor genesis and as a driver mutation in IDH mutant glioma. The mechanism underlying glioma genesis by mutant IDHs has not been clearly elucidated. However, several possible hypotheses are reported. As shown in the figure to the left, the structure of 2-HG, 2-hydroxyglutarate, and alpha-ketoglutarate are similar. Therefore, 2-HG compete with alpha-ketoglutarate and inhibit alpha-ketoglutarate dependent enzyme, such as TET family, enzyme family and German C domain containing histone dimethylase. Mutant IDH induced 2-HG inhibit the TET family, 
which increase his, which might lead to global DNA maturation in the glioma CPG island maturation phenotype, dishing. Histone demetrialized inhibition by 2-HG increase histone maturation. These epigenetic changes are believed to affect gene expression, contributing to tumor genesis. 2-HG also uh, reportedly stabilized HIF1 alpha and sus subsequently result in an increase in HIF1 alpha target gene expression by inhibition of polyhydroxylase enzyme. Consequently, IDH mutant glioma cell escape from hypoxic environment. In addition, 2-HG increase reactive oxygen species through the NAPD and NAPDH balance, contributing to tumor genesis. The contribution of mutant IDH to tumor genesis has been proved in experiments using artificial glioma models. Previously, Dr. Sonoda made IDH wild-type glioma model from normal human astrocytes by, uh, by transfected with human papillon virus 16E6E7, which inactivate p 3 and PRB, and introduction of HTAR. Astrocyte, astrocyte became immortal, immortal, but not transformed. Added last V12, the cell became transformed. Based on this model, we introduced mutant IDH1 into human astrocyte expressing E6, E7, and TAT. The IDH mutant cell made colony in soft agar, meaning the cell became transformed. Additionally, CRISPR mediated ATRX knockdown cell were generated, generated from E6, E7, expressing human astrocytes. The mutant IDH was introduced. The cell became transformed too. Interestingly, normal human astrocy astrocyte cells could not become transformed by adding mutant IDH, or mutant IDH1 alone. From these experiments, it is suggested that some genetic disorders in addition to IDH mutation are needed for gliomagenesis. Next, let me talk about 1P90 quadration. Previously, 1P90 quadration has been reported to be predictive and prognostic marker in oligodendroglioma. In WHO 2016, 1P90Q code deletion is needed to diagnose oligodendroglioma. 1P90 code deletion means simultaneous deletion of all short arm of chromosome 1 and long arm of chromosome 19. The codeletion of these two chromosomal arms is due to a balanced translocation between chromosome 1 and 19 and subsequent loss of other chromosome arms. Because the mutation in CIC, which located 19Q13.2, and FUBP1, which located 1P31.1, were found in about 50% and 20% of oligodendroglioma, respectively. These genes are considered to be associated with tumor genesis in oligodendroglioma. This table is a summary so far. Diffuse, as, diffuse glioma is divided by the status of IDH and 1P90 quadration. 
The photograph in the right of the slide shows pathological characteristics of astrocytoma, IDH mutant, and oligodendroglioma, IDH mutant, and 1P90 codilated. Astrocytoma IDH mutant shows immunopositive of, for P53, which means mutation of P53, and immunonegative for ATRX, which means mutation of ATRX. Oligodendroglioma shows the opposite result. It shows immunonegative for P53 and immunopositive for ATRX. She impact on our update to recommend it that WHO grade 2-3 diffuse astrocytic tumor with IDH mutant can be diagnosed as diffuse astrocytoma IDH mutant. If there is a definite loss of ATRX, nuclear excretion, and strong diffuse P50, P53 immunopositivity, without the need for 1P90Q testing. Oligodendroma frequently showed that showed mutation of TAT promoter, whereas astrocytoma IDH mutant does not. Let's move on to the next topic, telomere. Telomeres are DNA protein complexes that protect chromosome end. Telomeres in vertebrates comprise a region of 3,000 to 20,000 TTAGGG repeats at the end of chromosome. The length of telomere shorten after each cell division. And cell go to arrest stage after limitation. To overcome this issue, many types of tumor cells maintain the telomere length via telomerase activation, while some types of tumor elongate the telomere length by telomerase, telomerase independent manner, which is known as old. So in the process of cell division, chromosome replication causes progressive telomere shortening. Telomerase maintains the length of telomere stability by adding TTAGGG repeats to the end of the chromosome using its, its complementary TAC sequence as a, as a template. Together with TAC, uh, TAC subunit as a catalytic component. ALT is a telomerase independent mechanism to elongate their, their uh, telomeres. ATRX, in collaboration with DHX S3.3, promotes the processes of telomere shortening. TAT promoter mutation increases TAT expression and activates telomerase activity, which maintains telomere length. As shown in previous slides, that promoter mutation is frequently detected in oligodentoglioma and glioblastoma IDH wild type. In glioblastoma IDH wild type, that promoter mutation was reported to be associated with poor prognosis. Another mechanism is old with which ATRX DXS and histone H3.3 are associated. ATRX mutation is evaluated by immunohistochemistry using anti-ATRX antibody. If nuclear is negative for ATRX antibody, ATRX is defined as mutated. IDH mutant diffuse or anaplastic astrocytoma shows the old phenotype. I talk about, next I will talk about CDKN2. As shown the graph in the light, homogeneous deletion of CDKN2AB 
has been identified as a marker of poor prognosis in patients with IDH mutant lower grade astrocytic glioma and in all grades of IDH mutant astrocytoma. The frequency of CDKN2AB homogeneous deletion ranges from 0, 0 to 12 percent in WHO grade 2, 6 to 7, 20 percent in grade 3, and 60 to 34 percent in grade 4 astrocytoma IDH mutant. Based on the results shown in previous slides, she impact now update five recommended that added mutant astro added mutant astrocytoma with microvascular proliferation or necrosis or silicon to a b homogeneous duration are referred to astrocytoma added mutant. WHO grade four. IDH mutant astrocytoma that lacks significant mitotic activity, histologic anaplasia, microvascular proliferation, necrosis, or cdkn 2 ab homogeneous duration has astrocytoma IDH mutant grade, WHO grade two. IDH mutant astrocytoma that contains elevated mitotic activity and histological anaplasia, but lack microvascular proliferation, necrosis, and cdkn 2 ab homogeneous deletion, and astrocytoma IDH mutant grade 3. So far, I have explained about genetic abnormality in lower grade glioma. Moving on the next section, I would like to talk about glioblastoma. Most glioblastoma lacks IDH mutation. The alteration of main three pathways are revealed to be associated with occurrence of glioblastoma by the comprehensive genomic analysis of TCGA data. One is RTK-PI3K mapped K pathway. The abnormality of the pathway is found in almost 90% of glioblastoma. Some cytosin kinase receptor are well known, EGFR and PGDFR, which promote cell growth via RAS mapped K, PI3K activation. The next is P53 pathway. TP53 encodes the tumor suppressor P53. In response to DNA damage, P53 poses cell arrest. The third is RB pathway. RB is tumor suppressor gene which encodes protein regulated G1S checkpoint. This shown CDKN 2AB is associated with the pathway. Glioblastoma is divided into several subtypes based, based on transcriptional pattern, classical, mesenchymal, neural, proneural. The proneural subtype is highly prevalent in mutation or amplification of PDGFR and mutation in IDH1-2 and TP53. These tumors are G-SHIMP positive and comprise the majority of secondary GBM. The classical subtype exhibit common amplification and or mutation of EGFR as well as the homogeneous deletion of CDKN2AB. The mesenchymal subtype shows an increased prevalence of muta mutation in NF1, PP53, and P10 genes. Finally, the neural phenotype shows the expression of neuron 
characteristic markers like NEFL GABR1 with astrocyte and oligodendroglial differentiation marker. In glioblastoma, gain of chromosome 7 and loss of chromosome 10 are frequently detected. Third promoter mutation and EGFR amplification are also frequently detected in glioblastoma. These three factors are recognized as characteristic genomic information of GBM. Despite appearing historically as a WH grade two or three neoplasm, IDH wild type astrocytoma with at least one of these parameter are per prognosis. Therefore, in C impact now after this three, the tumor are recommended as diffuse astrocytic glioma IDH wild type with molecular feature of glioblastoma. WHO grade four. The recommendation was changed as shown in the slide in C impact and update six. These three param genetic parameters are recommended as a criteria for a diagnosis of glioblastoma IDH wild type. Considering the chemotherapy of glioblastoma, temozolomide is the most frequently used. Temozolomide is an alkylating agent that adds methyl group to DNA. Temozolomide induced cytoxy is mainly derived from O6 methyl guanine, which is repaired by MGMT. When MGMT promoter is unmatched, the expression of MGMT is increased. In that case, temozolomide is not effective because temozolomide induced O6 methylguanine is repaired by MGMT. As shown in the upper of the slides, among the patient with MGMT promoter maturation, overall survival in two groups treated with radiation therapy or radiation therapy plus temozolomid was significantly different. On the other hand, among patients with unmaturated MGMT promoter, the difference is overall survival was only marginally significant. Interestingly, among patients treatment treated with radiation therapy overall survival in patient with MGMT promoter maturation was, uh, was longer than patient with MGMT promoter and maturation. In this way, MGMT promoter maturation is predictive and prognostic factor in glioblastoma. Some papers classify glioblastoma using the presence of TAT promoter mutation and MGMT promoter maturation. In the paper, patient with the TAT promoter mutation and MGMT, MGMT promoter maturated glioblastoma had the short, shortest survival. This red line. Whereas those with TAT mutated and MGMT maturated glioblastoma survival the longest. This figure shows the hypothesis of gliomagenesis associated with genetic abnormality. These genetic aberrations are considered to promote gliomagenesis. Next, I will talk a little bit about pediatric glioma. In 2012, mutation of histone coding genes in pediatric glioblastoma has been reported. H3F3A coded histone H3.3. 
case 27M mutation and G34RB mutation of H3H3A has been reported. On the other hand, K27M mutation of HIST1H3B gene, which called histone H3.1, was also reported. Glioma with K27 M mutation frequently occur in the midline. Whereas glioma with G34 mutation located in the hemisphere. In 2016, WHO classification, diffuse midline glioma H3K24 mut 27 mut M mutation was added as WHO grade 4. Because H3K27 M mutation has been detected in not diffuse glioma, such as ependymoma, parasitic astrocytoma, she personally applied to, applied to recommended that diffuse midline glioma H3K27 M mutants should be named for tumors that were diffuse midline glioma, and H3K27M mutant. She impact on our six recommended that name of diffuse glioma H3.3G34 mutant for a diffuse IDH wild type glioma of the cerebral hemisphere with G34 mutation of histone H3.3. As the abnormality of BRAF, BRAF V600E mutation or KIA1549 BRAF fusion has been reported. BRAF 600E is detected in PXA gangliogrioma or spratentorial parasitic astrocytoma, whereas KIA KIA 15409 BRAF fusion is found in infratentorial parasitic astrocytes. This figure is a summary of pediatric gliomogenesis. Finally, I talk about treatment. For glioblastoma, maximal cell resection followed by radiation therapy and temozoloma is standard treatment. For high-risk gri high grade 2 glioma, which means older age or without gross total resection. And for grade 3 glioma, radiation therapy plus PCV or radiation therapy plus temozolomide were often performed. The problem is that there has not been enough data for each lower grade glioma based on WHO 2016 classification because many clinical, tri clinical trials started before publication of WHO 2016 classification. However, in several clinical studies, Subgroup analysis based on the diagnosis according to WHO 2016 was performed. I introduced two clinical trials. What is RTOG 9802? RTOG 9802 is a trial to evaluate the adding effect of PCV on radiation therapy. A total 251 patients with WHO grade 2 glioma aged over 40 years or less than 40 years with subtotal resection or biopsy were random, randomly assigned to radiation therapy or radiation plus PCV. Progression free survival and overall survival were longer among those who received com combination chemotherapy in addition to radiation therapy than among those who received radiation therapy alone. 
of 106 case subgroup analysis were performed. 34% were IDH wild type astrocytoma, 41% were IDH mutant astrocytoma, and 35% was oligodendroglioma, IDH mutant, and 1P90 codrate. Notably, treatment with post radiation PCV was associated with longer progression free survival and overall survival in astrocytoma, IDH, mutant, and oligodendroglio. In contrast, no significant difference in either progression free survival or overall survival was observed with the addition of. PCV in astrocytoma IDH wild. Another trial is Catnon trial, which evaluates the additional effect of concurrent temozolomide or adjuvant temozolomide on radiation therapy in grade 3 astrocytoma. Newly diagnosed non codilated anaplastic glioma, which means anaplastic astrocytoma, were treated with radiation therapy along radiation therapy with adjuvant temozolomide, radiation therapy plus concurrent temozolomide with adjuvant temozolomide, radiation therapy with concurrent temozolomide without adjuvant temozolomide. Adjuvant temozolomide chemotherapy was associated with significant survival benefit. On the other hand, Concurrent temozolomide did not increase overall survival. Subgroup analysis revealed that concurrent temozolomide and adjuvant temozolomide increased overall survival in anaplastic astrocytoma as its mutant. Interestingly, either concurrent temozolomide nor adjuvant temozolomide increased overall survival in anaplastic astrocytoma as its wild. So in conclusion, many genetic abnormalities have been found to be associated with gliomagenesis. New clinical trial based on the new diagnosis are warranted. So this is acknowledged for Yuichi Hirose and Yoko Kato, and uh, this is um, uh, UCSF lab last people and Joy D. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Ohba. There was a very exhaustive uh, overview on uh, gliomas from a uh, let's say molecular biological point of view. Uh, am I somehow correct that we are going with our diagnostics now nearly down to the individual tumor? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm... Uh, whether we can expect in future that we shall be uh, going to individualize tumors, that the molecular biology will allow us to define exact individual tumor, which would be different from the others. Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> no idea. Doesn't matter because I have the feeling that from the DOMAS deport uh, classification, we've made a huge uh, step forward within the, say, 15, 20 years. So we can expect much more in the near, near future. Then another yes. question. Uh, we all are using radiotherapy. And we all know that uh, radiation is uh, uh, oncogenic. Mm -hmm. What are the differences in the tumor before the radiation and relapsing tumor after the radiation? Do you have any idea about this? Yeah, it depends on the cell type. So sometimes, uh, as you said, that radiation induces oncogenesis. And uh, for example, uh, grade two astrocytic tumor change and transform to three or four by radiation therapy. Um, but, um, so it depends on cell type. For grade four tumor, it, uh, radiation therapy is needed, I think. And for the three, it is also needed. But um, for 
grade two tumor, it, uh, I have no uh, answer. It depends on the cases. But uh, uh, previous clinical trials show that uh, radiation therapy before or after recurrence, it is no, no different of uh, overall survival. So uh, it's a problem, big problem before or after recurrence from the therapy is started. Thank you. Uh, the next question, before I shall quit torturing you, if you could uh, a little more elaborate on uh, uh, BRAV genes in uh, uh, children's uh, pilocytic astrocytoma, uh, can we expect some uh, practical uh, steps? For um, children tumor, very, very small number, uh, there are very small number of tumor for children compared to other case. So it's uh, very hard to... <laughs> Okay, and uh, then in you have shown that in uh, anaplastic astrocytoma, the current treatment we are using is uh, uh, somehow effective in uh, IDH mutant tumors. Does this apply to glioblastomas as well, the mutant versus uh, wild type? What mean? Uh, once again. In grade three, in anaplastic astrocytoma, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the randomized study you, you, you did, you have shown that the effect for overall survival was beneficial of the whole treatment in IDH mutants only, mm -hmm. not in wild mm -hmm. type. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Does it uh, apply to glioblastoma to grade four as well? This, this... So very, it is very uh, confusing for glioblastoma. Uh, it is mainly IDH wild type. Uh, Temozolomide, concurrent or adjuvant temozolomide is effective for grade four glioblastoma. But uh, anaplastic astrocytoma IDH wild types mainly sim uh, have a similar prognosis compared to glioblastoma IDH wild type. But the uh, effect of temozolomide is not shown in the uh, clinical trial, in this clinical trial. So I don't know why this is. Uh, I see. It's interesting. Uh, we have uh, three minutes left. I, I must congratulate you to keeping the timing perfectly. Uh, can we have the, the questions from the floor? Yeah, yeah. I think we can open this topic for discussion. We can have questions for both Professor Fujimura as well. So I would like to start with my co-host, Dr. Liu Bun Singh. Oh, thank, thank you, Raja. Uh, I have some question for Professor uh, Fujimura. Uh, Professor, I, I want to ask you regarding the watershed uh, uh, shift. Uh, do you find that the double bypass uh, would help to reduce the, the incidence of watershed uh, uh, shift? Uh, my second question is uh, regarding uh, hyperperfusion. And you show that uh, uh, BP lowering drug are effective, but they are systemic. It cause the contralateral uh, ischemia problem. So, is there any study looking at the bimanual compression of the STA uh, in cases that when you do post-op uh, uh, CT uh, perfusion, we show uh, hyperperfusion? Is there any study looking at the bimanual technique uh, compressing on the STA to reduce the risk of hyperperfusion? My last question, Professor. Uh, is regarding the asymptomatic patient. If you incidental found the Moya Moya disease, and how how extensive perfusion study will you perform? Are you going to do a spec study and a functional study? And how do you follow up then? Uh, what are the first symptom that will make you uh, to go towards a surgical bypass cases? Thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the three questions. All of them are very great question. The first question, watershed shift phenomenon. Okay, uh, I think it's a good idea. One of the choice to perform the bypass surgery, uh, by double bypass surgery instead of the single STMS anastomosis to resolve the, uh, um, reduce the risk of watershed shift phenomenon. But uh, another issue is that if you make a double bypass, you have more chance to have a local hyperperfusion because the, in the in one surgical field we have very limited choice for the recipient artery. So if we make a, a effort to 
make an osmosis for a very fragile, more fragile osmosis, I mean the second choice bypass, it could cause uh, increased risk for the uh, uh, local hyperperfusion further. So uh, maybe it's a difficult question, but in some case, we can prepare the double anastomosis as you suggested. I think it's a good idea. The second, second question about the manual compression of the STA, I think it has a diagnostic value to prove the involvement of the hyperperfusion. If the patient has a neurologic deficit, and if you make a manual compression, I have one um, patient uh, in the initial case, she has a progressive headache, and if I perform the manual compression, uh, her headache uh, was reduced. So I, co I was convinced she had a local hyperperfusion. Another important diagnostic value is that reduce the blood pressure and see the symptom. If the symptom improved, uh, there is a definitive involvement of the hyperperfusion. But uh, so about the, uh, the uh, management of the hyperperfusion, I don't think it's a good idea to make a compression because uh, it's immediately after anastomosis. So uh, it can cause uh, uh, unexpected thrombosis or something. So uh, I don't think it's a very good uh, idea for the management. But it has a, definitely has a diagnostic value. So the final question about uh, asymptomatic incidental uh, moema disease patient. Of course, it is very important to follow them up. Uh, I, I perform the uh, um, MRI, MRA for every six months. And if the patient becomes symptomatic, I move forward to the flow study with a spec or something. So, and the, and the most important point of the MRA is I, I observe the horizontal image of the uh, MRA to see whether the PCA stenosis is present or not. If you, if you find the uh, asymptomatic patient with a bilateral stage three moya moya, uh, she could be symptomatic after the progressive stenosis of the posterior circulation. So if we, uh, we, we should be very careful to recognize that any change of the PCA involved uh, during the follow-up period. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to press upon one more uh, question to Professor Fujimura is that, uh, as you said, lowering BP is essential in uh, reducing complications in patients who have hemorrhage due to uh, hyperperfusion, but that also is a risk factor for thrombosis, as you said, is uh, the manual compression. So have you found your uh, any patient who had uh, graft thrombosis as a sequel to lowering BP? And the second question is that uh, the risk of hyperperfusion, as you know, is directly correlated with the amount of blood passing through the uh, donor artery. So, do you have you evaluated your patients with a uh, like flow site flow metry, transit flow time flow meter to check what is the direct link between the uh, velocity of the vessels of the blood and hyperperfusion? Ah, thank you, Dr. Raja. Uh, they are both a great question. About the first question, blood pressure lowering is effective, but it has a potential risk for hemodynamic ischemia. But not, uh, not I, I have never caused a thrombosis of the bypass um, after the blood pressure lowering. One of the reasons is uh, I use the uh, antiplatelet agent. I, I continue the antiplatelet agent during the preoperative and postoperative period. And, and the second point is uh, I, I never make an excessive blood pressure lowering, just between the 110 and the 130 between, uh, mercury between, between. So I avoid excessive blood pressure lowering and use the uh, antiplatelet. And uh, for the second question, flow meter, of course. The, I use a transonic flow meter sometimes. And it had a predictive value for the postoperative hyperperfusion. And yeah, and one, uh, one in one case, uh, one of my colleagues caused intraoperative bleeding due to the uh, after immediately after bypass, and the flow meter showed very high uh, value. But if we reduced the blood pressure, the flow meter significantly reduced. So uh, I think it's a very good idea to use the flow meter intraoperatively.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, Professor Benes. Yeah, the, I have one remark and one, one very simple technical question. A remark about the STA compression. Many, many years ago, I had a patient whom I did uh, bypass, uh, but for ischemic disease. It was not Moya Moya. And he came back in half a year and he was very, very disappointed because he told me that uh, I'm having my transient ischemic attacks uh, many times a day. He had a glasses, very heavy metal glasses. When he put them on, he squeezed the STA and he had a uh, hemiplegia. It, it was really a very s uh, simple solution. And one question, Professor Fujimura. Yes. In uh, your EDAMS uh, procedure, do you open the arachnoid or not? No. Okay, that's a great question. I personally uh, don't make a tremendous effort to open the arachnoid. Uh, nowadays, we believe that angiogenesis can occur, uh, uh, can penetrate the uh, arachnoid. Uh, angiogenesis is something like a scrap and build. Matrix metal protease destroys the extracellular matrix and then and vascular genesis, angiogenesis occurs. So uh, theoretically, uh, we, we, we don't have to make a tremendous effort to cut all the arachnoid or make a uh, pyre suture or something. I, I, I just may put, the, put the artery um, muscle and that's it. So uh, th this is my uh, idea. And most of the Japanese surgeons maybe do that. Yeah, thank you for the question. Agree. Thank you. Thank you. I agree. So much. So if there are no further questions, uh, we'll wind up this session. Uh, any concluding remarks from Professor Pavesi? Oh, I, I say hello to everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. So in that case, we'll wind this up officially. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kaito, I would like to sincerely thank both the speakers of today, Professor Shige Oba, Professor Miki Fujimura, and the chairs, Professor Vladimir Banes and Professor Pavesi, for coming here and teaching us about uh, Moya Moya disease as well as uh, follicular markers of glioma. Thank you, my dear co host, Dr. Liu Bun Seng, for joining. So, until we all meet on next Saturday, it is bye bye from all of us. Thank you.